Hello, everybody. It is me, Pacific, the walking human train wreck, as some of my trolls say. Loser, whack job, geek, nerd, dork, guy that can't get any girlfriends. You know, I've heard it all. All of those are untrue. All of them. I like trains, but I'm not a train wreck because we're still riding down the rails. We're still pushing that big T handle forward on the locomotive, but <clears throat> I'm more into ships anyway. So we put the helm to full speed ahead and we just keep on going. So <clears throat> today we're going to talk about man's world. Why? Because I can. Because we talk a lot about women. We talk a huge amount of time is spent on my channel dealing with American women, but I want to tell you the difference. I like my job as a school bus driver. I like some of the people I work for. I like some of the people I work with. But there's a lot of people I don't like working for within the organization. There's a lot of people I don't like working with. They're just not nice people. In America, we have a special thing that goes on that if somebody doesn't like you, they have a professional way of pretending that, you know, they, they imagine in their little minds that you can't see what they're doing. And one of the things that I learned going to Hong Kong in 2008 when I chased Beth was body language, something that I had failed to see most of my life. I mean, I saw little glimpses of it. Now, I look at a woman, I look at a guy. No, I'm not looking at a guy to have relations with him. But I can tell by a person's body language whether they're accepting me or not. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Well, we in America have been conditioned to go on works. But as an atheist friend of mine says, trust the actions, not the words. And that's the truth. So many guys say, oh, I really like that hot woman over there. I said, do you, do you see when you walk up into her presence what she does? Well, she's not interested. I said, no, watch her body language. Rolls the eyes, got the defensive stance. I said, you need to learn to read that. And we, we see too much Hollywood in our country that men watch the movies and they think, oh, if I keep trying give it up. One thing I've learned as I got older is if a woman is into you, you don't have to play the game. If a woman is into you, you're going to know. This idea that the man's supposed to do this, do that, we live in a different age now. I find that me just being myself on Facebook, people will show an interest in me. Unfortunately, all the people that show an interest in me are too far away. Gosh, and how come all the girls that are interested in me are prettier than the girls that are interested in me over here that I'm not into? And the ones that are pretty in the U.S. aren't even as nice as the ones over there. Just saying. So yesterday we go to one of our vendors that fixes truck. They got fixes our trucks. They're a huge mechanic shop as well as their own diesel tow truck business. This is a man's world where you pull up the truck, park it in the lot for them to service, get out, step on the ground that is saturated with oil and grease, and it just smells like a mechanic shop. And the guy who is calm nature, small guy, has big trucks, and he's been working this business. All of his brothers are mechanics, and you see a brand new engine block just sitting there, the engine block shell, and the piston chambers are as big around as coffee cans, and there's a giant tow truck with all its tool cabinets open and all the air wrenches and all the different stuff, and guys in greasy coveralls and Carhartts and blackened blue jeans, and yeah, Pacific finally works in a man's world. We go to one place to deliver a truck. The guy comes out, slender guy comes out. And I had gotten in this truck, and the minute I opened the door, I was like, wow, bajo, as they say in the Philippines, stinky. It's a sleeper semi, and it reeked. So let me tell you, there's some truck drivers that have some bad habits. And it stunk, and it was messy in the cab. And the truck drove fine, but I got there and I couldn't wait to get out of it. And the salesman that I work for, 
excuse me, was talking to him. And he said, did you get this fixed? Did you get this fixed? Yes, yes. He said, well, this is CB's truck. I'm like, CB's truck. So CB stands for crybaby. He says, you saw what it looks like inside. And he looks at me and I nodded. And he says, but he complains about the outside of this truck. He says he can live in an effing dumpster, but he's all worried about the outside of this. I thought, wow, people are funny, aren't they? And it was a dumpster inside. I got into a sleeper truck years ago when the boss, who was still at the place I'm with now, he's retired. He asked me to pull up two trucks that had just came in that we were going to take somewhere. I got in the one and I about threw up. I mean, it smelled like pee, poo, B.O., and who knows what. Some of these trucks have an interesting smell. It smells like the inside of a pool hall. The cigarettes saturated in there and everything else. And I think, wow, what a life. You're just sitting in your little box all day driving and stinking yourself out of existence. Pacific is a clean guy. If I had a truck, my truck would be as clean as my room. Tidy, clean. And I think, gosh, how can somebody live like this? But I love my job. I have not had one problem with the guys I work with. One guy jokes and teases with me, but in a good way, there's no crap. They tell me what they need done. I get it done. I go down to the truck storage lot where we got 200 trucks stored in there for sale. Try to start them up. If they don't, jump start them. If not, pull the batteries out, put new batteries in, 45, 50 pounds a piece, four batteries per truck. That'll kill you. Either start some of them because the fuel filter has just lost its prime. And yesterday he had me test drive three nice maroon trucks, 10 speeds, and boy, were they nice. Went out the highway, went cruising along, turn on the AC full blast, make sure we're turn on the stereo. But, uh, you know, trucking life would be fun. Pacific won't do it because... I don't want to drive at night. I don't want to be bound by a logbook. And uh, no, I just don't. I don't want to be going into cities not knowing where I'm going. And yeah, I just, it, it, too much stress for me. I'm getting older. I like coming home every day. But it's a man's world. And I notice that the level of BS that I deal with has disappeared by 100%. Working with women is tough. And I know a lot of women get mad when I say this, but I think ultimately, if we had done what we were supposed to do, I think most women should go home and stay home and take care of the home and take care of their man and let the man go to work. Unfortunately, we live in a society that's upside down and the cost of living requires two people to work that if I marry somebody, she's going to have to work. Or if she doesn't and I'm going to care for her, she better not be a materialistic pig, because I won't put up with it. I won't even get involved with somebody who, you know, is so caught up in the stuff and money. Pacific, would you really take care of a woman? By the way, excuse me, I would do the best I could. I have noticed when you try to follow God's ways, things tend to work. Something most of society never tests or tries to see if it's true, but it, it has worked for me. Where things get out of joint is when I'm walking out of step with God and doing my will instead of his. I run into roadblock after roadblock, like chasing Beth in Hong Kong. Oh yeah, he let me go over there, but there was problem after problem after problem. When he allowed a snowplow to hit me in Montana, that redirected me right down here. God provided a place, God provided a job. Yes, my son has hit a lot of bumps, but there is some improvement. When you do what God wants you to do and you're where you're supposed to be, you have peace. Things tend to work. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying you won't get persecuted. You'll still have your struggles and problems. But Pacific is proud to say to his viewers, I'm glad I played the man and stayed here. You're not going to let Colorado and Denver butthole culture run me out. I'll go when God says, now you may go. And when God leads you into or out of a place, it's far better than you yourself packing up and going there by yourself. 
because I still come back to this. Unless the Lord builds a house, they that labor to build it labor in vain. Whatever you set out to do, Christian, if it is not the will of God, it will go. <laughs> It'll be a sandcastle with the first wave. And, and it's true. I can give you testimony of my own failed experiences where I ran out in my flesh, in my strength, did this, did that, and failed. When you do what God wants you to do, the consistency of following God and submitting to him. And I remember a guy in Prescott, Arizona said, is, is, is there anywhere in the Bible that says you must live in a specific geographical location to serve God? No. But does God have a specific, specific geographical locational for us? Yes, I believe he does. I don't believe you can just move wherever you want. Goodness knows I've tried. I've lived in Akron, Ohio, Duluth, Minnesota, Virginia, Minnesota, Hibbing, Minnesota, Los Angeles, California, Mammoth Lakes, California, Prescott, Arizona. I think I said Akron, Ohio, Colville, Washington, Seattle, Washington, Spokane, Washington. I've lived in Aurora, Denver, Inglewood, Lakewood, in the suburbs of Denver. I lived in Hong Kong. My heart wanted to stay there. I like being in a man's world because you can go to work, you can do your job, and you can leave, and there's nothing hanging over your head. You don't have to worry about being called in the office. We have one female secretary. She does her job, and she doesn't start drama. She can't. There's no other women to start it with. She's actually a nice girl. She does her job well. And that is the way it should be. There should be more men in the workplace than women, and men should be the ones in leadership, not women. Call me chauvinistic. Call me misogynistic. If that makes you feel better about yourself, go ahead. But it's simply not true. I have worked for women bosses, and they don't do a good job. Women are not made to be leaders. Women are made to be submissive to their husbands, submissive to God. Men are made to lead. Men are made to go to work. And it says in there, if a man provide not for his own family. Now, I want to qualify that because we live in a day and age where women are expecting on the dating sites to have a financially secure man. No. You want equality? Why don't you be financially secure? Why don't you take care of my bot? Why, why can't I expect that? There's actually some women that make so much money that they would be very open to having a man just be their lover and said, I don't need you to work. I just need you to love me and, you know, be my personal love slave. Pacific doesn't feel right about that. Pacific believes that I need to be the man. I need to do my part, even if it's a meager attempt at nothing that God will provide. And I just watch what goes on. And any place you have a lot of women working, there's always tons of problems. This place that I work is fairly tight. There's a lot of things to do. I'm busy. Yesterday, you're hopping. You're not sitting on your butt. The boss said, you're allowed to take a lunch. I said, no. I work six hours. I work straight time. And that's the nice thing. I'm not required by this because I'm contracted. I'm not required to take the mandatory 15-minute break, half an hour lunch. I can go and just work like a dog. It's funny. My ex-wife called me yesterday, 3.30, I'm at work. I answered the phone because the sales guys call me to ask if I can go stop by this place or that place if I'm running around in a truck and get something that's en route. And she says, I have a flat tire. Now, I admit, my first instinct is, and I'm not your husband. Why are you calling me? I said, where are you? She told me where she was. I said, do you have a spare? No, I don't. I said, there's nothing I can do. I said, Take your car, put it in drive, and slowly creep it off the main thoroughfare where you're at and get it safely out of traffic. That's one. Two, you're going to have to call a wrecker. And I said, if you had a spare, when I get off at four, I can come down and we'll change it out for you. But if you don't have a spare, there's nothing I can do. You know, I said, I'm not going to leave your car on a jack and... Walk away from it while we go get a tire repair. I said, that's, I don't think that's a good idea down in that neighborhood. A Christian man actually stopped 
and assisted her. Jane's attire found that she had a donut underneath the mat in the back and in the trunk and changed it for her. And I said, go to discount tire and go get a new tire. Don't want to drive on that. It's the front tire especially. And you don't want to go over 35 miles an hour. And even the man of the house says, why is she calling on you? And I thought to myself, why does she expect me to solve her problems? She called me to tell me the good news of somebody come. And she goes, thank you for letting me be a woman. And I admit I'm a woman. I don't know what to do. And I said, no, I don't have a problem. I said, I'm frustrated because there's not anything I can do. And I didn't tell her the other part. I'm frustrated thinking, I hope you're not putting this as if though this is my responsibility because it ain't. You know, if I get a flat tire, am I supposed to call you up and say, hey, could you come and help me? But the principle in this is that Pacific needs to do the right thing. And the right thing was to be kind to her, <coughs> kill her with kindness. It's funny, though, when I call her phone, she doesn't answer 99% of the time. But when she calls me, and she called not once, she called twice. I'm in a truck. I'm shifting gears in the lot truck. And I'm like, I cannot get the phone out of my pocket. The lap belt comes down. And finally, when I get parked, I get a call again, and I'm thinking, yeah, see, when you want something, you bug, 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 bug me. But when I call you once, no answer. You don't even return the call. Pacific is tired of that double standard, man. But I just say, you know what? You do the right thing. Let God bless you. It's funny. Sometimes Christians can be a pain in the butt. Come home, told them what happened. I said, well, God provided for her. A guy stopped. He was a Christian man. Changers. So you think God provided? I said, yes. He sent somebody to help her. And he laughed sarcastically. Okay. I said, don't you have faith? Then last night he was going off about, you know, just some mystical weird stuff. And I said, you know, I don't believe in that. And he said that a prophecy, a guy told him at church, he's going to live to be a hundred. And I'm being polite because yesterday was his birthday and we celebrated his birthday. And I, you know, it's funny. He'll put stock in things that I just don't believe in. But then when you see God answer prayer that even for her, even though she's a problem, she's a child of God and God helps those of us that are his. And that's something we all need to keep in mind. Always remember, viewers, that that person you can't stand that's a Christian, God loves that person just as much as he loves you. That's You have to tell yourself that out loud and it will shock you. Because there's people that do some wrong things to other Christians, but God's love for them is the same love he has for you. Be glad for that. Because there's times we're not always nice to God. I know I'm not. I know when I step out in the lust of the flesh, God isn't sitting there going, oh, good job, bro. I, I know he isn't. But I like being in a man's world because even that reminded me she still called on somebody, a man, to help her with a tire situation. Now there's those beefy women that get out there, I don't need a man, I'll change it myself. Well, good for you. One of the guys I work with has managed to save up $550,000 in retirement and told me he made $233,000 last year selling trucks. Now many of you say, oh, why don't you do that? No, I'm not a sales guy. And just because one guy does, he's, by the way, he's the top, top salesman for the truck the in the, the the brand the international trucks top salesman in the country unbelievable now i believe that's for the used market i'll have to ask him if that includes new that's that's impressive and you know why he's successful i said so what's the secret to your success and he says do you see when we went over to this guy's place today he said when he's had a problem with the truck i get it fixed for him I take care of my customers. I don't just sell them a truck and walk away. He said other salesmen will do that. 
And he said, I sell them a truck. I make sure it's good. I massage my customer base and they keep coming back to buy more. He said, he's got FedEx contracts. He's got all these different contracts and he can't get enough trucks. His business is growing. If I can make him happy and I can give him reliable customer service, he keeps buying. And he said, that's the way it is with all my customers, man. You know, and that is ultimately how we're going to win people to Christ. Not this fake, hey man, do you know that Jesus died for your sins, man? You have to have a relationship with somebody. You have to show a consistency of caring for somebody. And when they finally laugh and mock at you one too many times, when they go on hard times, they're going to remember you were there. And the Holy Spirit could use that to reach them. But I learn a lot in my day-to-day -day world. I learn a lot. It's been raining so much, these trucks in storage have been sitting for quite a while that the brakes rust and stick to the inside of the drums. And I have to get a long metal bar and a small sledge and tap the outside of the drums to release the brakes. And uh, it's funny, one day I couldn't do it. And I put it in reverse, put it in drive, and that one wheel stuck. And what I usually do is I put the truck in reverse and just gently nudge it, and I'll hear click. And then I go forward and it's done. But some of them have been stuck, stuck, beat on it several times, and then finally it releases. But, yeah, it's interesting work. Um, there virtually everybody I deal with out there is in the truck business. It's all truck business. It's all heavy equipment. It's everything. It's Commerce City. And what is interesting is that... Um, my dealings with men, there's none of the BS. I do my job. I like it. They're happy with me. People greet me. How you doing? They shake my hand. It's like, wow, what is it about a bunch of women in a workplace that can poison the place? Yesterday, <clears throat> they hadn't done anything, but I, I did. I removed some people from my Facebook. I just... Didn't unfriend them. I blocked them, moved them. I thought, you know what? I don't want my female coworkers in here. There's a couple in there that are safe. <clears throat> They're not connected to all the drama and stuff. But I just removed them. I thought, you know, Pacific needs to have his place where his coworkers are just not in it. And, uh, yeah, I do things that are unconventional, but it's like, you know what? I live, the, the culture that I work in, <clears throat> excuse me, most of what I talk about on YouTube would offend them profusely because the very things that I talk about is the kind of crap that I hate. And the work culture I'm in and the bus place, a lot of those people are guilty as charged. And it's not that I'm afraid of them seeing my views. It's just that I feel like, you know, there's just some people that don't belong in my inner sanctum. I want to thank my viewers that have been writing me personal messages telling me, don't let these trolls get to you. Dropping names of quality people on my channel that make very good comments. Schultz's name was mentioned, several others. Pyramid had others because you guys are clear thinkers. And there was a whole bunch of people mentioned by this one individual and then I don't want to call him out and embarrass him because he didn't give me permission to do so. But he was praising the channel, saying, you have helped me to grow as a Christian. I think, really, even with all my struggles. It's amazing. Some of the most vicious trolls are atheists and Christians. I find that very interesting. And why is that? Now, I will respond quite turt to others. When they're being rude, I will pull no punches and let them have it. But I don't troll on people's sites. I don't go to people's channel and stuff like that. And again, 99.9% .9 of all the trolls have no picture, no videos. They're losers. They're not going to put their face out there because they're cowards behind keyboards. Even somebody said accurately the other day, these Christian trolls are lower than Pandora because at least Pandora put her face out there, made a video attacking you. Good point. Good point.
Men or people never showed his face. Loremaster did, and I don't know where Loremaster's at. I don't care. My channel's not in competition to anybody's channel. My channel has its own unique niche, and that's all I care about. There's other channels that may or may not blow the doors off of mine. We've got 2,900 plus subscribers. We've got 918,000 views. We're heading towards a million. And, uh, you know, I'm happy with what it's done. I never expected this to do what it's done. Yes, it'd be awesome if it had even more. But when I first started this, it wasn't about views and it wasn't about subscribers. I didn't even know about subscribers. 2,900 people subscribe to this channel. That's pretty humbling. Some of the towns I lived in were that small. Mammoth Lakes, 2,500 people when I was a kid in the 80s, 76 to 83. I've got a whole town subscribing to Pacific Ocean Asia. Or the new Pacific Ocean Superliner. Amazing to me. And you know, a lot of those subscribers are females. There are black people, there are Asian people, there are some Hispanic, South American, and Americans all on this channel that like to hear what I have to say. It's funny, I work for international. I actually don't work for international. I'm actually contracted by another company to work for International, where International pays them to, to hire the drivers that do the stuff. But I don't actually report to that company. I report to International for my daily duties and going in and out of that office. And when I left, I got the International to truck symbol, the diamond. It says International. I got that on the back of my truck. And I've had it ever since I worked there in 2005. And... Um, when I first met Beth online and I went to Hong Kong, I thought, boy, I've become international. And just as a sidebar, we have a whole bunch of international trucks going to Vietnam and they have actually opened up a service center and a dealership in Vietnam, international trucks. They're also in Australia, which is interesting. We have 65 trucks that I need to get ready. We need to get ready. Get them started. If the batteries are no good, put some cheap batteries in them. Get them fired up. Cracked windshields, get them replaced. Get them staged and ready for the drive out to take them either to Houston, Texas, or Fontana. And then they put them on a container. They take the mirrors off. They take the top part of the sleep berths, slide them in there, shut the doors, and send them over. They'll drain all the fluids out of them and send them over. Now, I want to tell you something funny. The salesman had me pick up a truck <clears throat> at a vendor that had been serviced. I've driven trucks long enough to know the minute I got in, I'm like, wow, this thing's different. He told me, go down the highway, test it, make sure the AC's working, and tell me how it drives, tell me how the gauges are reading. I shift this baby, I get into ninth gear at 55, I get into 10th gear, get up to 65, and it's still got lots of pedal, and I'm like, Wow, is this the Max Force International's Max Force engine? Why is this so different than the others? Go back, the head salesman sitting in the guy's, the boss's office, and I said, Man, that truck I just drove, that is the sweetest truck. I said, Is that the Max Force engine that's in that? Salesman looks at me with his poker, Don't don't go there, man. Don't go there. I said, What do you mean don't go there? And he says, It's a Cummins. And I looked and I said, that's amazing. How come it has so much more power? And the salesman says, look, do you want to work for Cummins or do you want to work for International? I can give you a job down at Cummins. I said, hey, I'm just teasing you, man. He says, no, it's okay, man. And they were giving me a hard time because I said, even on the school buses, the Cummins diesels have more power. And I like International, don't get me wrong. But I got to admit, I like that Cummins diesel engine. Love it. I tell you what, they are amazing. You know, I'm sick of the doofus, Dodge doofus diesel boys, but I will tell you what, that Cummins is impressive. Impressive. Carl sent me one on Facebook of a Dodge pulling a tree 
with the snag and the stump and pulled it right out of the ground, the chain to the trailer hitch and the back of the truck, the back wheels lift off the ground. That Cummins is a powerful engine. There's no doubt about it. And even in that truck I was in yesterday, I noticed a world of difference has shifted like a dream. That thing took off like a dream. I'm like, Man, why don't I just drive all the way to the Statue of Liberty and salute the lady right out of this truck? I would love that. It's fun driving these things. But yeah, I just wanted to update my viewers and tell you what a positive difference to get away from all the hens in the hen house. And uh, yeah, there, there's no misunderstanding with men either. That's the other thing. I can tell a woman, I can give her crystal clear directions as to how to get somewhere. You take a right on this street, you take a left on that street, and they'll still get all twisted up. The man can tell me, the men can tell me, you go down here, you take a left on this street, you take a right here, it's right there on the corner, it's right behind this business, and just pull in the gate. Oh, it's exactly as they said it would be. When a woman gives me directions, even senior drivers I've had will give me directions. They tell me to turn right here, I turn right there, it's a dead end, I'm like, ugh. Oh. I turn around, I go, they probably meant left, huh? And I go, left, yep, there it is. Every time, almost every time, a woman's giving me directions, they've been bogus. There's only one I can go to that gives me good directions. A female. That gives me accurate, good directions. And believe it or not, she's from Minnesota, but she knows the city of Denver like the back of her hand. It's been good to get out of there for a couple months. It's been good to do something different. But yes, I'm tired at the end of the day because it's it's hot. And now the rains have quit and it's hot weather now and out there with very little trees. And But most of the time I'm in something. But when I'm working on the lot and getting those trucks ready, what a pain. We have a lot truck, four banks of battery on the left, four in the back with a reading utility body and the storage cabinets for the tools and the ether and the tow ropes and everything else and um, that truck will jump start anything even when it's butt freezing cold we got a plug in that we can plug that into the 120 and charge both banks of batteries it's got a diesel fuel tank on the back it's an 80s Ford truck stick shift four-wheel drive and it rides like a buckboard and that truck continues to just run gas engine and I'm like, wow, that was there in 2005. And it was sad when I got in it for the first time Thursday. I said, man, I miss my boss. He and I worked so good together and he's retired. And I called him the other day. I said, okay, you're going to think this is mushy, but I got all sad when I got in your truck and you're not there anymore, man. He's an atheist. He cares. He's been a friend. I've met his wife. I've worked for him in his mountain property, getting slash out of the woods. He's been creating a fire zone around his house because of the forest fires that we do have in Colorado. He's getting trees away from the perimeter of his house. So he lives on a huge acreage with a lot of beautiful pines. And I drag those down to the road where in time he will load them on the truck and take them to the uh, limbs and tree drop off area for his county but yeah a snapshot in the Pacific's world I like driving the bus I really do but it's nice not to have to deal with mouthy teenagers it's nice not to have to deal with the drama in a break room it's nice to go to work do your job go home and people say see you later man have a good evening thanks for your work today thanks for your help today every day for all the crap that I hear women say about men I have never heard a woman tell me that her job with all her female co-workers has been a great place to be. Never. The men I work with are happy. They're doing their job and they love their job. <clears throat> a lot of the women I've met in life, they're not happy and they will sit there and pick and poke and cause drama and problems and undercurrents. And the sad thing is, is our female yucky culture is being exported around the globe. Hillary Clinton goes to China to teach the women to be more feminist and liberated. We're seeing more tattoos and more piercings and more queer, weird stuff. I mean, I'm looking at pictures of women from India this morning. They're beautiful. 
But American women and their tattoos and piercings, they need to take a lesson from the people across the ocean. If they're going to do it, at least there's a classier way to do it than they do. I see more women in Denver that look like somebody just took a can of spray paint and went like this all over their body. And I'm like, you, you paid money for that? You, you look like an alley ghetto wall. Fish hooks in the lips. Even the women in India don't do that. And it's true, and I'll say it again. The white women with the little tiny rhinestone in the nose, they are, can I use the word? They're bitches. They're awful. And I am starting to come more and more to the conclusion that women like that are probably lesbian and just hate men and will never come out and say it, will never come out. I see that with people that I know, and it's like, wow. I love women, though. They fascinate me. The way God put them together, their curves, their hair, their looks. Not the ones that have destroyed themselves. No, I'm not talking about them. Not the ones that are obese. Can't get into that. Somebody made a good point the other day. Said, yeah, obese men can't get a woman, but an obese woman can get a man. And the sad thing is, in American culture, women are at a premium. It's amazing. Everywhere I go where there's good-looking women, all you got to do is look at their body language, and that tells you the whole story. You don't need to spend time talking to them. You don't need to spend time getting to know them. You just look at their body language, and you just summed them up, put them in a box. You can put them on the shelf titled Irrelevance and leave them there. There was a woman in the chat room. Her name was Debbie. She had little bookends on either side of her name. And the first time I went to this chat room, it was a Christian chat room. She was one of the meanest, nastiest women, calling everybody a retard. Even me. Other people that were nice, she just called them retarded. And every other word or sentence she typed was laugh out loud, laugh out loud. And I would go in there and mind my own business, and this woman had that irritating voice, and she had a picture of herself from the 1970s that she posted on her profile, and all the guys say, you're really hot looking. I said, yeah, let's see a current picture of you, Deb. And I went after her. I thought, you know what? You're a bitch. She was from somewhere in northwestern Minnesota, and she'd get on there and start talking about canning, canning fruit and stuff. She said her and her husband were so in love. Then we started finding out from other chatters in there that she was flirting with the guys in the room. She bragged that she had been the longest person in that chat room 14 years. I thought, you're my age and you've been in a chat room for 14 years and yet you love your husband? Really? You're kidding me. Shut up, Pacific. No, I'm not going to shut up. Several guys and I would come in there and gang up on her. didn't matter. She was so crusty, hard, jaded. And then the guys that were 400 pounds and doing drugs and drinking would defend her. And the dynamic in the chat room made me realize, you know, this, this is the way it is in American culture. The chat room is a microcosm of American culture. Go into a bar. You got some woman who thinks she's all that in a bag of chips. She's not that pretty. She's definitely not nice. But then there's her surly bunch of guys back there that are still hoping to get a piece of her rear end and haven't, that are going to defend her and be nice to her. And any new guy comes in and sits down and minds his own business, and that woman starts popping off. The guy says, hey, lady, shut up and stick it. And then you get all the big B.O., five inches of hair under the arms and their chaps, and what did you say, man? That's a woman over there. Oh, now you're going to be the hero for some piece of trash over there that'll never screw you. I know men, man. I know the way it all works. I'm going to be very honest now. In the chat room, you'd see people come in there and they'd have this very nice voice. And I'm like, gosh, that person's got a hot voice. You click on their profile and there's no picture. It's one of those silly little faces over a fish body. 
you know, those cutesy little things. It took me a long time to realize, you know what that it means? Those cutesy photos, she's fat. Those ugly cutesy photo things that they send. Then you see it on Craigslist all over the place. You'll see picture, you click on it because I want to see what they look like. And it's some cheesy little saying. And you're like, yep, no photo. And then you read on, I'm curvy. I hate to say this, folks, but fat and curvy don't go together. When I think of curvy when I was growing up, you go back to the 50s, 60s. Wow, check out the curves on that girl. We're talking about this. We weren't talking about a bell-shaped blob. That's not curvy. This is not curvy. I am hard on that stuff. And I'll tell you why I'm hard on the obese thing. I know there's viewers of mine that are working on their weight. I am not here to condemn you. At least most of the men take responsibility for themselves and work on their weight. I respect you for that. I would never say, oh, you're fat. You can't be my friend. That's not the way I view I know that not everybody has Pacific's metabolism. I know some people, it's a big struggle for them to keep their weight down. I understand that. I'm targeting the women that are obese, that are not pretty to look at. I'm sorry, but when you have your pants off, lady, I don't want to see folds of flesh down here. That's gross. I don't want to see folds of flesh under your breasts. I don't want to see an armpit that's that big around. And when you hold up your arm and you see all the cellulite wrinkles and these big things flopping in the wind, that is gross. Fat women have been so mean to me all my life, picked on me, made fun of me, shoved me. I had a fat girl named Becky. She was gross. She came into class smelling so awful one day, and the whole class was like, I never teased her to her face. I mean, internally, I'm like, Ugh, she's gross. One day in junior high, the last day of school, she came up with a bottle of perfume and blasted me right in the face. No provocation, nothing. <clears throat> my eyes went into overdrive and I thought, I hate you, Becky. You're a disgusting, nasty, smelly pig. <sighs> then I finally spoke my mind. Fat women, all exactly the same. They all got the same attitude. They all got the same silly justification for why they're fat. They all still got the same old attitude. I've had fat women come up and say, you're so scrawny and skinny. No, I'm slender. Well, let me show you pictures of scrawny. <clears throat> I've seen scrawny kittens where you pick them up by the fur and it's all fur. And the rest of the body's hanging down because they're so little. I'm not like that. I am height, weight, proportion. I'm lean. Now we have that silly little song all about that bass, no treble, which is now glorifying women that have big butts. <clears throat> and I want to say something very pointed from a Christian perspective, that we are all shaped and look differently. That there are German women, there are women from Europe, there are women that have bigger bones they're going to carry more weight just by the fact of their bone structure. What I'm talking about is lazy obesity. Couch potatoes, people that sit on the couch, eat junk food, don't manage their bodies, don't take care of their health, and have the attitude to go with it. You know, I just, I don't get that. And I've seen fat women posting on date sites that they don't like fat men. You got to be kidding me, lady. I wrote one in Spokane who was a heifer. She had a series of pictures, all different pictures. And I wrote her back and I said, look at your photos. You're obese yourself and you're, you don't want an overweight guy. And I'm not overweight and I'm not coming on to you, but I'm just saying, oh, I got all these fuck you responses and everything else. I was like, really? You've got to be kidding me. And I thought to myself, this is where we're at. This is where we're at in our culture. Right is wrong. Wrong is right. Men are not allowed to have an opinion against fat people, fat women and specifically. And I just shudder inside and go, as long as this white boy's alive, I have every right to say, 
you go ahead and move on, lady, because I ain't moving in your direction if you can't take care of yourself. I'm sensual. I'm erotic. I want an erotic, sensual woman to take care of herself. I don't want a woman with pit hair. I don't want a woman with B.O. And I don't want a woman with fat hanging off of her. I have seen some women that are a little bit plump that have been very pleasing to me. So I'm not talking about them. Everybody's shaped different. But I've watched in my lifetime a culture go from slender women that cared for them, even plain Jane women that took care of themselves. I find myself so aroused by a plain Jane, small-breasted female who's clean and smooth under here, who smells good, washes her hair. I'm like, gosh, you're hot. There's so much ugly fatties out there. It's like the plain Janes look like tens. Sadly, some of the plain Jane girls are some of the nicest girls you'll meet. When I was a kid in school, I actually got along with the tomboy girls. No, they weren't lesbian. They weren't dykish. They were just like to wear blue jeans and play in the dirt with us guys. And they were still foxy to me. When I talk about a lady, Pacific could never be with what I call a dignified prissy lady lady. Um, I think that'd be tough for me. I am very outspoken, I'm very blunt, and I feel like for me to be around a woman like that, I'd have to literally change myself into something I'm not, and I can't do that. Pacific is Pacific, and um, I want a woman who can handle me, and I want a woman I can handle. I want a woman who's feisty in the right ways, erotic in the right ways loving in all the ways and I, I want a woman who can be passionate and spontaneous with me and yet totally responsible i want a woman who thinks a lot of the same way as me i know there will be differences and i'm okay with that as long as the differences aren't relationally damaging but man if you're from northwestern minnesota and you're into canning and you're into calling everybody retarded because you don't like anybody and you and that was the other thing she'd go on about how minnesota was the best and i said oh here we go debbie i live seven years and you're part of the world and i'm telling you what minnesotans don't get out i said have you ever left your little farm over there shut up pacific answer the question have you ever been out of there have you ever been anywhere and she used to make fun Oh, yeah, Pacific's and all these geeky Asian girls and these Asians. They're so gross and they're so dirty. And I said, yeah, Debbie, when's the last time you posted an updated picture of yourself? You're probably 350 pounds and having everybody believe you look like Olivia Newton-John in the 1970s. I couldn't believe the stuff that went on chat rooms, the meanness. Some of the sarcasm and the satire I got came from being in there. It's like, wow. And this woman would constantly say, well, God's got my back. I don't need to count myself to anybody. God's got my back. Finally, I had to put this woman on ignore, go in there and talk to the people I did get along with. And somebody would write me a personal message said, Debbie's going on and on about you. I said, you know what? I don't care. I said, you know what? I've already been far more places than she has. I've had more experiences than she has. She lives in a box. She cans. And I, I remember saying... One day, I said, the best way to sum up De Debbie is I said she's never been outside of her place. She says she's happily married, but yet she spends days and nights every day for 14 years in a chat room. She talks about her canning. She criticizes everybody she doesn't like and declares war on anybody that comes in this chat room that she doesn't like. I said... Debbie is one of those you can put her in a box, write on the box, irrelevance, and stick her on a shelf in a canning cellar in Minnesota and put a date on it, and in 20 years, it'll still be there. Everybody in the chat room laughed when I said that except her. Shut up, Pacific. Shut up. That, that, that. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Touche, pussycat. Chat rooms are awful. 2012, Yahoo shut them down. They were also a hotbed of iniquity. I had asked myself many times, what is it about the computer and the cams that people just felt so comfortable with perfect strangers just disrobing, taking off their clothes? 
unbelievable. I participated in that. I thought it was fun. And yet I look back and go, you know, if you go back 20 years before that and somebody had told me this was going to happen, I would have been appalled. What? Are you serious? We are the frog in a kettle. We have been more tolerating of things now than we would have 30 years ago. That is for sure. I like women, but I don't like what's happened to our culture of women. I don't like it at all. And it's nice to work in a workplace where I can see a huge stark difference that there's none of this emotionalism. There's none of this worried about offending. The guys are blunt. They use language. And I know that as a Christian, we're not supposed to do that. But I'd rather work with a bunch, bunch of guys that don't beat around the bush that are straight shooters than a bunch of women playing the pretend game and then stab you in the back, talk crap about you when you're not looking. And uh, if one of those men has a problem with me, they're going to let me know right now. They haven't because there hasn't been a problem. I was thinking of my son the other day. I thought, oh, I wish he could spend just a week in this world. Toughen him up a little bit and say, look, you've been around women too long and you're getting too sensitive. And I am not putting women down for sensitivity. We men need a woman to soften us. But the problem with a lot of American women is they want to turn us men into little girls, and I won't have it. I won't. I don't want a woman who's going to control me because I'm not into controlling her. The best analogy I can use to view a good marriage is a team of draft horses yoked together, side by side, running in the same direction together. That's beautiful. Most marriages, you got one pole on the left, one pole on the right, and the kids are the ones in the wagon, and the wagon's going like this, and those kids are getting jerked around. Don't you think there's going to be some damage when they're banging their head back there over and over? That's why when you date, when you meet women, you'd better make sure you're yoked the same way here, here, and with regards to God. Compatibility, heart connection. We guys in America make too much about looks. I'm guilty as charged. I'm not saying the three women that I was involved with were hotties. They weren't. I've always lowered my sights because I said, I'm not going to be able to get those hot girls ever. But the more years ago by, I start to realize these girls, they may be hot on the outside, but they're not hot on the inside. They're dead. What makes them excited? Another trip to the mall. Text messaging. I mean, it's ridiculous. Most American women today, there's no mystique to them. There's no mystery. There's no depth. There's nothing there. That every one of them, I, I like when they say, you don't know me. Oh, I know you very well, honey. Your name's different. Your background's different. But you're just like every other female out there. You all have the same grid of thinking. You all get caught up in debt. You all get caught up in SUVs, dogs, lattes, malls. What is there to know that's different from everything else? And that's why we need to pursue God, because you can know a car, you can know ships, you can be an aficionado and an expert of things, a historian, but it has its end. God's ways are beyond finding out. We cannot put God in a box. And that being said, that's why we need to pursue him. He is the ultimate fulfillment of everything that we're just empty inside of. That I could lust to my heart's content and it would never be satisfied. Never with women. There's always another woman that looks just a little bit different and another one that looks a little bit different. And that one has that long black hair and that nice brown skin. And then there's that pasty white one that's still hot. I mean, God has made women in such a way that this idea that <clears throat> you're going to meet one woman and she's going to be the Taj Mahal of all your sexual fulfillment. No, that's a lie. 
Any one of us can be tempted, even if we're married to the most beautiful, sweetest, charming woman out there. So if you're looking for marriage to get control of your sexual urges, it won't happen. Because once you do her, you're still going to be going down the street <clears throat> and pretty woman walks on by and you're going to look. I'm amazed at the diversity of beauty alone. And there's nothing wrong with admitting that. But marriage changes things. You're supposed to have eyes for your woman. And it's tough. You will have a fight on your hands because when you marry her and you start settling into a live-in relationship, things get old. The honeymoon wears off. And what do you have to carry you then? You're going to have a woman that bitches at you when she catches you noticing a scantily clad woman walk down the street? You don't need that. You need a woman who has understanding of you and still loves you. But you need to have enough together on a relational level that even though the honeymoon wears off physically that you still love and adore her and stay true to her. Sometimes, now that I'm getting older, I stop and go, do I really want to be married? I've had three failed ones. This marriage, would it actually benefit me? I don't know. Yes, there are women I flirt with. Quite a few of them. Not here. But people that I know on Facebook, whatever. But I don't lead anybody on. I've mentioned Maharani. I like her. I adore her. But it sucks. She's there and I'm here. And many of you say, just go over there and see her. I can't. She lives with her parents. I'm not going to go get a hotel for two weeks where I can only see her maybe when she's sneaking from university to see me. I mean, it's ridiculous. What's the point? But yes, as I posted that ELO song the other day and saw the faces and how much more innocent people were looking, their body language was so different. And you look at women today... They're so jaded. They're so hardened. Even businesses I go into where a young woman sitting at the front desk who's in her 20s, they're so jaded. And I look back when I was in my 20s, and the women were not like that. But they are now. They, it is. It has definitely changed. They, they have been just, in some ways, wrecked. Their innocence is gone. The sweetness is gone. And it's it's crazy. Anyways, Pacific Lake's working in a man's world. i got to go make breakfast and get ready to go. But, um, yeah. I love women. But I think there's a time and a place for women. But men, when they go to work, men need to be in a man's world. They need to be able to come home to their wife and have a good relationship with her that doesn't involve work, that doesn't involve break room drama. That's just my opinion. I understand that we live in different times. I understand that women have to work. For the nitwits to get on my video channel and say, ah, why do you say all Chinese are like this? Did you hear what I said at the beginning? My caveat, disclaimer. Not all Chinese are like this. Not all women are like this. I believe that women have to work today. It's the way the, the, the corporate mentality is, the way our country's set up. Unless a guy's pulling down a good income. Mm -hmm. And for you women that are looking for a man to financially take care of your butt, I think that you've got the wrong perspective. 
You need to fall in love with a man because you love him and let God be your Jehovah Jireh. Your man is not your provider. Your God is. Supposed to be. Too many marriages are based on how much a man earns and what his titles are and whether the family approves or not. And that's why 50% of all marriages end in divorce because they're not marriages of the heart. Something to think about. Meanwhile, I go back to my world with engine blocks with pistons the size of big cough folders, coffee cans, and I go, I like driving the big trucks. I feel like I've come full circle. When I was a kid, I played with yellow Tonkas. Now, I drive big Tonkas, and it's fun. And I like the positive feel that I get from going to work every day and not having to put up with the crapola. My experiences are teaching me that when we get away from God's ideal, when women flooded the workplace, affairs went up by a huge margin, that many men have lost their job because of unruly, rebellious, troublemaking women. Oh, we, we know about men and all their problems. Women have told us that all our lives. But what the women aren't saying is the damaging, destructive things they've done, lying about co-workers, making up false allegations of sexual harassment. I've heard a story. A guy went up and told a woman, I like your outfit. She went and probably complained. The guy was called in the office. You do that again, you're fired. He commented on your outfit, not your boobs. Wow. And yet women dress in such a way that you can't help but look at their boobs. And then they get mad if you do. Women are funny in this country. The hypocrisy in them is off the frickin' charts. <clears throat> no, Pacific doesn't hate women. I have a lot of women on my channel. And there's women on my Facebook. And they know I don't hate them. But boy, our culture of women leaves a lot, a lot to be desired. And you ain't gonna find it in them. You just not. This is Pacific, signing off. Happy Thursday, everybody. Bye-bye.